it is time for the weekly gathering of the Happy Warriors. So welcome to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I, your rabbi, reveal how the world really works. That's right. So thank you for being part of the show. Thanks for listening. And uh, those of you who've been helping to tell other folks about it and bring aboard more new happy warriors, well, you've been doing a great job, and I thank you very, very much indeed. Have you ever heard the question, um, look, do you work to live or do you live to work? And usually there's two things that we know about the person asking you. Number one that person is um, trying to distract you. They, they've got some sort of agenda. Number two, they're probably broke. That's right. Because invariably, what they're trying to tell you is that you're working too hard. And they're saying, hey, be like me. That's right, broke. That's what they're suggesting. And so when people say, hey, come on, do you work to live or do you live to work? What they're hoping that you're going to respond is to say, no, of course, I work in order to live. But you see, it's a bit of a silly question. It's a little bit like saying, hey, do you eat to survive or do you survive to eat? Well, I don't only eat to survive, because if I did, then I would just eat, you know, vitamins and, and some bread and water, or I'd gobble down a, a couple of cans that I'd quickly open. Um, but I certainly wouldn't sit down to a meal, and I wouldn't enjoy it anymore if it is served on a nice starched white tablecloth, and it's served up on beautiful china plates, and the food is laid out in attractive ways. All of these things, let alone the company at a meal, all of these things add immeasurably to my enjoyment of eating. But if the only reason that I ate was to survive, none of those things would matter. They'd be completely irrelevant because I'm only eating in order to make sure my body has enough fuel to drive it till the next meal. That's all. In the same way that an old railway locomotive, steam locomotive, used to stop and pick up water and coal in order to be able to get to the next place where it would be able to load up with water and coal. Even all those old Western movies, you'll remember, lonely railway siding, and one of the things you always see is a water tank. And the, uh, the engineer would bring the locomotive um, so that the water tender was just under the tank and he'd pull the lever and water would come gushing down and fill up the tank. That's right. If that's what eating was all about, I only eat in order to get to the next meal, then I really don't need all the things that add so much to eating. So do I eat in order to survive? No, that's obviously not true. Well, then I must survive in order to eat. That's ridiculous. Eating is certainly an important part of my life. It's far from the only part of my life. So I don't eat in order to survive, and I don't survive in order to eat. I must conclude this is a silly, nonsensical question. How's about, do I live to work or work to live? Do I live uh, in order to work? Not at all. I have many other interests in life. Do I work, therefore, in order to live? No, if that was true then if I won the lottery, I'd stop working. And smart people do not stop working. It's one of the reasons you don't retire, right? Because to stop, if working was only in order to live, when you have enough to live on for the rest of your life, you can stop working. But that's not a healthy situation. Everybody knows the stories of the things that happen to those who win the lottery and quit work. As a matter of fact, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to find people who have won the lottery big time, quit work, 
and lived wonderfully successful and happy lives. It's really hard to find stories like that. Contrary to what you might think, oh, if only I had won the lottery, I'd never go to work again. Well, you may not go to that work, you may change your but you'd find very quickly that uh, your life would become um, a real downer without work. Uh, there shouldn't be just employee of the month, there should be boss of the month or employer of the month because there is so much that we get from going to work. So the whole question is completely nonsensical. Uh, work is not why I'm living, and I'm not living in order to work or working in order to live. Nonsensical question, and nonetheless one that you keep on hearing. People always say, particularly, you know, if you're hardworking and you really, you, you know, I remember this used to happen to me sometimes, less so these days because I, I, just, I don't mix with people like that anymore. But um, I, people would say, you know, come on, uh, you know, let's uh, let's get together. And I, I say, look, I'm really sorry. I just, you know, this is not a friend. It's not somebody who with whom I have a close relationship. And I, I just say, look, I'm really sorry. I don't have time for random socializing. I really don't. I'm working very hard. And I have whatever extra time I have available is for my family, for my Bible study. Um, and to just sort of get together with you and, and have a beer, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just I don't have time to do it. And the answer would sometimes be, oh, come on, do you just live to work? Is that all there is in your life? No. Well, you know, you, you work to live, right? You know, you're not just living to work, you work to live. Well, come on, live a little. <laughs> well, you see, that's what we come across all the time. And uh, it's a nonsensical, do you live to work or work? Silly, silly question. Uh, work is a part of life. It's not the only part of life. and um, it, But it is an important part of life. It's a very important part of life. Why do I say this? Because it adds meaning to our lives. It really does. Um, so much so that... Uh, uh, well, about three or four years ago, a person consulted me, asked if he can talk to me about a family problem. Fine. So I set up a, uh, a time, and uh, we got onto the phone. We started talking. And he tells me a, a long, detailed account of his 23-year-old son who's at home, and uh, he uh, dropped out of one college, went to another one afterwards, didn't do well there. Uh, eventually, uh, he came home, and now he sort of sits around the house most of the day, and, uh, you know, I try to get him to come to work with me. I want him to get interested in my business. You know, he has very little interest. He's always saying, no, he can't come today. He's busy. What are you busy on? i got stuff. And, uh, you know, I, you know he's, he's not on drugs or anything. We'd probably know that. But, um, you know, certainly a lot of time on his computer and uh, uh, definitely video games. And he talks to people all around, a lot of conversation. Um, but he's 23 and like, there's no, he's not thinking of, of any part of life at all. What do I do? I said, does he ever leave the house? And uh, the person said, oh, yeah, yeah, nighttime, he, he often goes out in the nighttime. I, oh, really? Uh, does the bus run near your house? Knowing full well the answer. And he said, no. I said, well, how does he go out? He takes his car. I said, oh, okay. And I'm sure you know exactly where this is going, right? And I said, now, tell me something. When I fill my car, you know, it's like $40. And I'm assuming that when he fills his car, it's going to be something like that. And I'm just curious, um, where does he get that money to do that? And there was a little bit of a pause, just enough for the sound, the soft sound of a blush to come through the phone line. And he said, um, well, you know, um, my wife and I um, give him an allowance. I said, how about the car? Yeah, well, we, 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 we bought him the car. 
and um, spending money, money to get out. Yeah, yeah, no, we, we do that. I said, well, uh, you don't really need me, and um, I think you are not going to realize the, that the value of what I'm going to tell you exceeds what you are paying me for this consulting session. And he said, um, what are you going to tell me to do? I'm going to tell you and your wife to get on the same page and cut off the funding. You are enabling a life with no meaning. And one of the best things you can do for him is create an atmosphere of an acute money shortage. And what's going to happen is that the atmosphere around the house is going to be extremely painful. And you're going to wish you never asked me what to do. But if you can hang in there and stay that course and remain steadfast and your wife can remain on the same page, then within six months, you are going to call me up and thank me. And you're going to tell me everything is wonderful again. Um, I said, what's more, when you feel yourselves flagging, call me. When you feel yourselves unable to witness your son's pain and suffering, and when you cannot any longer stand his abuse at you for turning off the spigot, the cash spigot, call me. Let me help talk you through it. Let me try and re-strengthen your resolve. Well, uh, I'm happy to report this particular story, although I wasn't at all certain uh, that it would. The story had a happy ending, and they called me numerous times uh, during the next few months, many times, to tell me what he was doing and what he was saying and how he was abusing them and how he was yelling. Um, and he was going to leave the house and he's going to kill himself. All the threats and everything that came on, and, and that was a hard one, by the way. Uh, I, was, I was pretty sure that that was not going to happen. Um, for for reasons that have nothing to do with this part of the conversation. But uh, it had a happy ending, and uh, he went and got a job, and it didn't last very long. He got another job that went better, and he stayed at that job for a while, did, did pretty well at that, and then came and applied for a job in his father's company. And his father asked me what he should do, and I said, don't, don't engage in nepotism. He hasn't deserved anything yet. Uh, whenever you find yourself losing strength, just remember some of the names he called you and, and your wife a year and a half ago. Uh, start him at the bottom, at the very bottom, and make him report to somebody else, not to you. And let that person know that there's no special favoritism, that if he cannot hack it in the company, he's not going to stay. And uh, it had a very, very good ending. The story worked out well. But uh, when, when people have no work, it's very difficult to find purpose in your life and meaning in your life. Does that mean work is the only thing? No, of course not. You know our five Fs. And as some of you more uh, regular and uh, diligent and alert listeners know, the, um, uh, the four Fs became five Fs recently. Uh, and that's it. I'm not going to surprise you with any more. That, that's it. I just, I just took a little while to add the last one because I, I wanted you to really get the hang of family, faith, friendship, and finance. But then we added fitness, physical fitness, spelled F-Y-S-I-C-A-L-F-I-T-N-E-S-S, -S, physical fitness. That's right. Uh, and that is the fifth one. You see, these five F's actually provide you with a roadmap um, to meaning in your life. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, let's start with family. Right. Uh, the connection with other people in your family, hugely valuable in terms of providing you with a framework a foundation on which to build your personality and your life. Family, hugely important. Friendships, yeah, very important. Uh, with no friendships, life can be incredibly lonely. So uh, you, you need that as well. Faith, absolutely. 
right? I mean, faith, that there's something bigger than my life. There's something up there that is transcendent and all explanatory and all powerful uh, who loves me. I am important to him as he is to me. That's, that's a very important dimension of meaning. And um, finance, yeah, that's work. Getting some finance, hugely important. And uh, fitness. You know why that provides meaning? Because you are struggling against your lowest instincts. My lowest instincts, like yours, would be to sit uh, around on the couch, watch television, and eat stuff and drink beer. That, That would be my basic instinct. And now I say, you know what? I'm going to have to eat in regulated quantities. I'm going to exercise vigorously and strenuously and methodically and routinely. And I'm going to get my fitness up. So you are fighting your baser instinct. That is a kind of a war which brings meaning in and of itself as well. And uh, it is hugely satisfying. When you speak, when you hear of athletes talking about runner's high, that point at which your body stops hurting and you feel as if you're flying, uh, that is something that comes as you feel triumph over your bodily baser instincts. So those five things bring real meaning to life. Um, Somebody wrote to me recently, and you know how to do that, right? You write, you go to uh, uh, rabbidaniellappin.com and uh, you go to where it says contact us or about us and then contact us and uh, you're able to send me a note. Well, that's what somebody did, wrote and said, uh, I would like to add a sixth F, and that was, would be freedom. And I said that on a show in the next little while, I'll mention why I wouldn't dream of doing that. It's not just that I'm not interested in adding any more F. Six is the right number. Um, but no, it's not that. It's that freedom doesn't belong. Freedom is something I might fight for. Freedom could be a value that I commit myself to, absolutely. Um, But that's not an essential part of everything that makes me who I am. And I think all of those, uh, all of those five F's, faith, you know, you get that, right? Uh, Fitness, you get that. Family, absolutely. Friendships, you get that. Finance, I find, is one of the hardest ones for people to understand. Finance is truly difficult for people. What is the challenge? The challenge is that deep down they feel that there is something unworthy about the having finance as something that's important to me. Family, yeah, my faith, yeah, sure. Friends, yeah, I stick by my friends. But that money is important to me. Now, that is very difficult for people to fully grasp. And so, uh, I want to read you a a short passage from a great American psychologist, lived quite a long time ago in the 1800s, and uh, his name is William James, and the book is called uh, The Principles of Psychology, by William James. And here is the section I want to read to you from chapter 10. In its widest possible sense, however, a man's self is the sum total of all that he can call his, not only his body and his psychic powers, he means spiritual powers, but his clothes and his house, his wife and children, his ancestors, Mm. and friends, Mm -hmm. his reputation and work, his real estate, his horses, his boat, and his bank account, 
All these things give him the same emotions. Listen carefully to this. All these things give him the same emotions. If they wax and prosper, he feels triumphant. If they dwindle and die away, he feels cast down. Not necessarily in the same degree for each thing, but in much the same way for all. That is so beautiful and so profound and so very true. I might, I might actually put that, those exact words in the description uh, of this podcast, perhaps, um, just because I think it's worth really reading at another time and seeing what it's all about. You see, what he's saying is that uh, it's all the five F's. Your, your physical health, your friendships, your relationships, your family relationships, everything, and your money and your bank account and your real estate and your house, everything you own, all part of everything that makes up the totality of you. That's right. And so, obviously, you can see that if you are somebody who tragically and lamentably um, was brought up by a single mom, uh, with a lot of boyfriends, with uh, who spent a lot of her time inebriated with either drugs or alcohol or both, and you were basically pretty much left to your own devices or a television set, and you got to where you are, then I know you struggled. And I know that you built up massive, colossal reserves of internal fortitude to get to where you are from that beginning. If, on the other hand, you grew up as a beloved child of successful parents, and there were four wonderful grandparents, and everybody was married all their lives to their spouse, and they all were creative and productive and successful, and you've got happy, successful siblings, and um, when your grandparents passed on, they left as legacies to your parents and to you and your siblings certain things, certain assets. And your parents have things and they've launched you in life. You certainly have had it much easier than the other person, much easier. But you probably are also a lot farther ahead. Because you are standing on the shoulders of your parents, who stood on the shoulders of your grandparents. You didn't have to do it all yourself. Just think about where science would be if every generation had to start from the beginning and figure it all out for themselves. Let's imagine we didn't have a thing called books, and there was no way to communicate information. And each generation figured out certain things, some more than others. But at the end of it all, the next generation had to start all over at the beginning. Right? Wouldn't do very well. The system that was put in place is a system whereby there are huge benefits from intergenerational continuity. Now, one of the things that secular and very often socialist-leaning governments attempt to accomplish is to try and establish equality so that everybody should be the same, and they want to, as much as possible, eliminate any benefits that might accrue to one person over another by virtue of family background. It's one of the reasons that lefty governments, as much as possible, tend to impose estate taxes, which I believe are much more accurately referred to as estate taxes. Excuse me, are, I, are more, I, I said that wrong. What I meant to say was they are much more accurately referred to as death taxes. That's right. All your assets, on which you've already paid taxes coming around the first time getting it, now when you pass on, you cannot just hand them off to your relatives and your descendants and your heirs. No, a whole lot of that, as much as possible from the point of view of a left-leaning government, should be paid as a tax. And their logic for that is very simple, right? Their logic is, hey, when you pass on, that doesn't belong to you anymore. Everybody understands that by the basic natural laws of property, 
property can only be owned by live people. You're no longer alive. You don't own your property anymore. Well, who does? Well, the government, obviously. Really, it should belong to everybody. The idea that your children should enjoy this advantage over all the other children of society is evil. It violates our principle of equality. And so we will distribute it for all the other children. We'll call it a tax and we'll take it and we'll see that all the children will benefit, not just yours, including yours, but not exclusively yours. That's the argument. And it's a very strong argument for a secular mindset. Uh, there are now several school districts of which I'm aware. There are probably many more of which I'm not, right? Because there are thousands of school districts around the country. But there are a number of school districts that have um, uh, set up um, a, a system of uh, children learning at home. Some schools I know are doing it by telephone. Other schools have actually circular have actually handed out tablets to each child. Other schools do something else, but they've all, during the coronavirus uh, crisis, they've all been figuring out some ways of homeschooling, excepting a number of school districts have said, we're not doing it. Now, I'll tell you why they're really not doing it. They're not doing it because the teachers' union said, hey, this is a paid vacation. Never mind that many of the parents of our students are not getting an income. Nothing is changing in the income of our teachers. And on what is more, we're going to give them a few months paid vacation. That's the real reason. But the stated reason for why these teachers are not going to be doing any form of uh, remote teaching, because it wouldn't be equal. There are some children who have parents who will work with them. Other children do not have parents who will work with them. And if we do homeschooling, what that will do is unequally benefit the children that have parents who care, whereas it would penalize the children whose parents do not care. And so nobody is getting any homeschooling in those districts because if they did it, the results would be unequal. That is the thinking here. Um, the truth is that a very strong instinct that we all have is to do things for our children, save their lives at the margin of life, save lives of our children. We do anything to save our children. But uh, not if we're not talking about in extremis, um, then we want to give our children the best start. We want to make sure they're healthy. We want to give them the best food. All of these things as much as possible are things we want to do for our children, right? And um, that uh, being the case, and you'll pardon me, uh, I know I'm um, just taking a second here because I just want to look up something. And... Um, Okay, um, so uh, that's the idea. If you come from a, a stable family, and ideally your parents came from stable families, you are at a huge advantage. And it is an advantage that uh, most left-leaning governments are at pains uh, to overcome, so is that um, nobody should enjoy an advantage that comes from an earlier generation. And so, the, assuming now there you are, um, you are the sum total of all of these aspects of your life. And what is it that gives you meaning? It is serving. It's getting outside of yourself. And so faith is one way to do that. Friendship is another Family is a hugely important one. Finance, that's right. But wait a second, finance isn't getting out of myself. It's getting money for me. And that is where you are wrong. Money is about serving other people. And this is dreadfully important. Um, it, it's so absolutely vital 
that everybody understands this. You will never reach your maximum financial potential as long as you think that work is about what you get. To, uh, to put it very directly, you actually don't have to worry about the money coming in as long as you make sure that you are obsessively preoccupied with the needs and desires of other people. The money will come by itself. That's how important that is. And so, yes, meaning, meaning comes from getting outside of yourself. As far out of myself as possible is with God. That's with faith. My family, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's out of my friendships. Yep, take care of them. Fitness. Remember I said earlier it's overcoming your basic instinct. Yeah, fitness is really getting out of yourself as well, isn't it? Because it's your mind forcing your body to do things it doesn't really want to do. Your body wants to eat a whole lot and work and exercise very little. And you're exactly the opposite. And so that is really getting outside of yourself. In, and that's why being fit and getting fit can be hugely satisfying and meaningful. Are there people who take it to an extreme? All of these things can be taken to an extreme. That's right. Uh, I, I know somebody who never, ever married. Why? Because he never, ever wanted to be away from his mother. He didn't want to have anything come between him and his mom. Um, so, yeah, that would be a case of family being obstructive, going too far. Faith, yeah, there is such a thing. I mean, there are people who sometimes develop such an intense love affair with God that they, they're not able to live a normal life like normal human beings. They can't. And um, uh, friendships, yeah, people sometimes even get misled and they say, listen, my friends wanted to do it. So all of these things can be abused. The question is balance among all of them. Now, one of the interesting uh, facts about society today, and I'm most familiar with society in America, and so it's here that I am focusing my comments, although I'm sure you will find application where you live as well. And that is that um, there is a division in American society. It is not a division between rich and poor. It's not a division between men and women. It's not in spite of the fact that the left tries to persuade you that the country is divided, the women and there's men who hate them. That's not the case. And the country is not divided between rich and poor in spite of the fact that they try and tell you, oh, the rich don't pay their fair share. The rich have to do this. The rich, the, the one percenters. All of this is designed to make you believe that the real division in the country is between rich and poor, or men and women, or color. Blacks and whites are divided. Not at the last black church I had the honor of speaking to in Washington, D.C., right, Bishop Harry Jackson's church. Um, I, no, I did not see it there at all. I did not see a division between blacks and whites. No, not at all. I saw us all children of God trying to gain deeper understanding into his book. And, uh, and so these are not the divisions in American society. What are the divisions? Well, the divisions are actually spiritual. The divisions in American society are primarily between those who believe that Judeo-Christian biblical principles are vital for our nation's survival and those who believe that Judeo-Christian Bible principles are primitive obstructions to what they think of as progress. Those are the, the, that is the main cultural canyon that cuts through the society. And there are people who are black on both sides. There are people who are white on both sides. There's rich on both sides, people with less money on both sides, men on both sides, women on both sides. Those aren't the divisions. The divisions are how do we feel about Judeo-Christian-based biblical values. And if you are somebody who, if forced to choose, will come down and say, yeah, you know what, um, there, 
there may be aspects of organized religion. I'm not crazy about etc. etc. But by and large, yeah, I, I believe that Judeo-Christian Bible-based principles are vital for America's survival. Well, then you will find your meaning in life from faith, family, friendships, finance, and physical fitness to whatever extent you do that. That's where you'll be. But what happens if you are somebody who believes that Bible-based traditional values are uh, inimical to American progress, that they are obstructions and they are things that must be gotten rid of and, and, and extirpated from society? Well, then, let's see now. Um, for you, faith, what is faith? Well, faith is the promotion of a government-centric society instead of a God-centric society. If you want to know one of the most fascinating divisions between those who believe that the government lockdown of the last two months that has destroyed the American economy, and those who believe the government is right and they must do more and they're working on the right track and everybody must wear masks everywhere, all the time, anytime, those people tend to be folks who are, shall we say, um, skeptical at best about Bible-based Judeo-Christian values. And similarly, states that tend to be left-leaning states tend to be very heavy on the government shutdown. Um, New York City has just had its worst murder week of the entire year, and uh, Mayor de Blasio has threatened to send police to drag people out of the water at the beaches next weekend. I mean, it gives you an idea of where they're at, right? And um, on the other hand, states that tend to be redder states, states populated by folks who are much more comfortable with Bible-based Judeo-Christian values, uh, those folks tend to believe their freedoms are being suppressed. Uh, they have become increasingly angry and resentful at government overreach, seizing un extra constitutional powers in terms of shutting people's businesses down. Says who? Where, 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 where do you come off on that? Well, it's an emergency. It's a public health issue. You know, if you gave me a few moments to think about it, I don't think there's a single activity that I could not have banned under public health emergency conditions. I could make a case for almost anything not to be allowed because it's a public health emergency. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the road to tyranny is almost always paved with emergency necessities, almost always. So, where, do, where does meaning come from? Well, meaning, if you are on that side of the spectrum, comes from promoting a government-centric view in the same way that I get meaning from promoting a God-centric view of reality. Uh, that's what they do. Now, to me, family is hugely important. But on the left, if you take a look at the uh, secular side of American society, family is not important. As a matter of fact, there is an attempt to undermine family. And what's the very basis of family, as I've explained in previous shows, the very basis of family is male and female, right? Man and woman. You are here and you have cousins because a long time ago, Grandpa and Grandma's eyes met across the room, and they linked arms on a journey through life. That is why you are here. And so, uh, not surprisingly, the left tries to undermine all differences between men and women, so that the entire foundation of family doesn't even have its basis for survival. So there's no family. Um, what, no faith, no family. Now, finance is bad, right? Because making money, you know, as one uh, notorious president once said, you never made that, right? It wasn't you. No, of course not. Because making money is reprehensible. Uh, you should turn to the government for the money you need, obviously. So, uh, no, that's no good. That's, that's pretty clear. So what happens next? What are you supposed to do? Well, it's very simple. Uh, fine meaning, no family, no finance. Faith is essentially the inversion. Fitness, physical, tremendous emphasis on health. 
huge emphasis on health. Can you overemphasize health? Of course you can. What happens if you are so focused on your body, exercise, uh, beauty? You know, the focus on your body is so intense that you have little energy, time, or interest left in cultivating friends, developing family, faith. Maybe you, maybe you even abandon finance. Yeah, absolutely there can be an obsession with health. Absolutely. And, um, and so what happens? What you find is that uh, on the left, for the most part, the pursuit of meaning almost always finds purpose in political expression. Um, and that's one of the reasons that the left has this messianic belief in climate change, global warming. They have to. Because saving the world from that fate becomes a messianic mission. Um, environmentalism, running out, of, uh, running out of things. We've got to preserve and save. Do you know what the sacred sacrament of the religion of secularism is? It's recycling. That's right. No reason to be recycling. As most of you know, and those of you who don't can find this out for yourself, most major American cities go and dump everything in the same place anyway because there's absolutely no economically viable way of dealing with recycled garbage. There was a time the Chinese took it off our hands, but those days are over. They've woken up to reality. They're not doing that. So um, it becomes desperately important to promote a doctrine of shortage. So recycling is important and a doctrine of global warming and climate change and sea level rise. All of these things become crucially important. And a war on wealth and money, that's all part of it. But they, these are the ways in which everybody needs to find meaning in their lives. Everybody needs to find meaning. And my recommendation is that meaning is most effectively obtained through the five Fs. Balanced, all playing, each playing its own specific role in your life. The faith, the finance, the friendships, the family, and yes, the fitness. All of that crucially important. Now, it's also worth bearing in mind that although what I'm about to say, I know this doesn't apply to you, particularly if you're married. I, 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 I don't think, if you're married, I don't think you would dream you wouldn't dream of doing these things at all. But what am I talking about? Waking up in the morning, your eyes are still barely open. They're struggling to open. You are yawning. You're just trying to get a sense of where you are and what time it is. And the first thing you reach for is not your watch or your clock. It's your phone. Why? And you turn to your phone. Why? Because maybe somebody text messaged me or emailed me, or WhatsApped me during the night. And I'm not laughing at this. I'm not belittling it. I'm just saying that, you know, it would be nice to, first of all, greet your spouse and say good morning first. But um, if you do this, I understand it. It's because interacting with other human beings is absolutely the most wonderful and amazing thing out there. And we... We, we find we can't resist it. It's one of the reasons that what we now call social media, brilliant. Uh, the, the cell phone altogether, brilliant. All of these things let us maintain contact with other human beings. We are created to connect with other human beings. Best way of doing that is through serving other human beings. Family, the Hebrew word for family is mishpacha. It means service, serving somebody. Because if everybody in the family tries to serve everybody else in the family, then everyone in the family gets everything they need. And you have this wonderful nurturing cocoon that is a refuge from a rough and tumble world. Yeah, family is fantastic. But it's a place where you get to serve people very close to you. And... Um, uh, faith, well, you serve God, of course. And uh, finance, well, that's the key thing. We make money by serving other people. 
And God loves that because human beings love it when their children serve one another. In other words, when you see your children not squabbling with each other, but taking care of each other, you love that. God in heaven loves it when we take care of his other children as well. And uh, serving, who are you serving when you're taking care of your physical fitness? You're serving your higher self. You're serving your soul. You're, you're making your soul better by saying, I can control my body. And it's a hugely beneficial aspect of physical fitness. Uh, you actually become a more powerful person, not just physically through the exercise, but spiritually through the discipline imposed on yourself. Or to put it more accurately, the discipline your soul imposes on your body. All right? Have you ever thought about uh, physical fitness in that way? You'll find it very helpful if you develop that line of thinking. And so that, ladies and gentlemen, gives us at least a little bit of an idea, does it not, um, of some of these mistakes that people make about money in particular. Do you work to live or live to work? No, that's not how it works. Meaning is very important in my life, and work plays a crucial role in the structure of meaning, as do four other things, family and faith, fitness and finance, absolutely. Um, excuse me, uh, four other things, uh, family and faith, uh, finance and friendships, in addition to physical fitness. Uh, those five things help to bring real meaning to my life. That, I'm afraid, is close to as far as we can go for today's show. Um, the website, rabbidaniellappin.com, make sure you are over there. And um, I spoke about work having meaning, right? Absolutely. Work does have meaning. And there are several places that we see this. One of them is a beautiful verse in Psalm number 128. And what it says is, Happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who, every, everyone who walks in his ways. Okay, fine. Second verse in 128 of Psalms, because you... You know why you're going to be happy? Because you will eat of the work of your hands. And that is what will make you happy. And what's more, it'll be well with you. So, yeah, it's, it's not talking here. It's not saying, hey, you better work so you can eat. It's saying work so you can be happy. That's right. People sometimes say money doesn't make you happy. And um, the mistake they make is the simplification it's not, not all money is the same. Unearned money never makes you happy. It makes you miserable. Winning money in a lottery doesn't make you happy. Earned money makes you very happy. Absolutely. In and of itself, it really does. So that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. Yes, um, eating is not just to uh, stay alive. There is meaning in it. And as Psalm 128 verse 2 says... Um, working, the work of your hands, the things you do, makes you happy. It's, it's quite apart from just being able to survive. It brings happiness as well. And that's why it is in the fourth commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 9, six days shall you work and take care of all your business. But this, the, the fourth commandment is all about the Sabbath. It's about not working. So, Surely it would be fine. I mean, I understand the fourth commandment says, do not work on the seventh day. Okay, fine. But you know what? I'm going to retire, so I won't work on the other six days either. I won't work on any of the days, but at least I'm not working on the Sabbath. So, Lord, I'm sure you're very happy with me. And the answer is not at all, because part of the fourth commandment is don't work on the seventh day. The other part of it is work and take care of business all the other six days. What happens if I don't need to? You do need to, even though you don't know you need to. And so uh, work is valuable. We don't work for the money. We work for the joy of serving God's other children. And the result of that is that, yes, money comes to us 
automatically. Uh, speaking of the Ten Commandments, if you visit the website, uh, rabbidaniellappin.com, you will discover right there that um, there is a product specially available on a, a reduced price for you. Listeners to this show is uh, something called the Ten Commandments. It's a one-hour audio program that breaks down the Ten Commandments in a way you'll never forget them. Come on, honestly, if I asked you to recite the Ten Commandments now, could you say them in the right order? Right? We, probably many people can get them together, you know, cobble them together, but how about one after the other, one through ten in the right order? Hard to remember, right? Not when you become aware of what ancient Jewish wisdom says about these two tablets and how to understand the connection between those commandments on tablet one and those commandments on tablet two. You'll never forget them again. You'll have them down and you'll understand them in a completely new and fresh way. That is the Ten Commandments over at the store site at rabbidaniellappin.com. And that, my dear friends, means that we are now as far as we can go for today. Thank you again for listening. Those of you who write in, I very much appreciate your letters. Many of you discovered that uh, I do respond, not always in very good time. It sort of sometimes takes a while before I get to them, but I get to a, a surprising number of them, by the way. Um, and uh, those of you who uh, take a minute to think of somebody else who might enjoy and benefit from this show and who I would enjoy having as a happy warrior, uh, go ahead and familiarize them with the show. I'd appreciate that, and so would they. So take a moment, think of somebody, and uh, shoot them a, a URL for the show so they can listen to it as well. And uh, that means that until the next show, ladies and gentlemen, happy warriors all, I am Rabbi Daniel Lappin wishing you nothing but good times with your fitness, yes, your faith, your family, your friendships, and your finances. God bless.